Hello everyone. Welcome to the First Unitarian Society of Milwaukee's online worship service. I'm Reverend Dina McFeeters and I'm honored to serve as Associate Minister. We welcome people of all genders, sexualities, ages, races, ethnicities, histories, and bodies. We welcome your mind, your heart, and your spirit. We welcome all that you are carrying with you today and all that your heart longs to set down. We'd like to pay a special welcome to guests joining us today. If you're visiting for the first time or joining us from afar, why don't you say hello in the chat and tell us where you're joining us from. I welcome you to our worship service today by inviting you to repeat our mission after me. We gather to nurture the spirit, engage the mind, and inspire action. Let's return to our beloved sanctuary for the lighting of the flaming chalice symbol of Unitarian Universalism. Good morning, I'm Ann Hefter and I'm happy to be your worship associate this morning. It was a glorious summer morning in the early 1980s. The sky was blue with big puffy white clouds. The leaves of the trees shimmering in the lake breeze, emeralds and jades and deep piney greens. I was sitting at the breakfast table, anxious to get outside. My eyes were on the big bay window looking out into the trees and winding path to the lake. I had this special place up north that I called my hideout. On the wooded lake shore, there was a circle of cedar and birch that formed a clearing. I would spend my time with saw and hammer and nails, building ramps and ladders, piecing together my fort. I would gather rocks along the lake shore to make my own little pier to walk out on next to a U-shaped cedar tree trunk. That was a perfect child-sized seat where I would sit and dangle my feet in the water watching minnows nibble my toes. I would gather moss to make a carpet for my hideout, I would, which would lead me to finding salamanders under rocks and frogs hopping about. I would spend my time in creative play until my mom yelled out the door, Annie, time to come inside. My dad would often take me for bike rides when I was small. I would sit at the front of his orange sparkly banana seat as, as he pedaled his huffy sling shot retro bike up the road to Cave Point and back. It was just me and my dad and the wind in our faces. He would sing to me or we would laugh together as we traveled. At this time, I would like to read a playful poem Going Down a Hill on a Bicycle by Henry Charles Beeching, a boy song. With lifted feet, hands still, I'm poised and down the hill. Dart with heedful mind, the air goes by in a wind. Swifter, yet more swift, till the heart with a mighty lift makes the lungs laugh and the throat cry. Oh bird, seabird, I can fly. Is this, is this your joy? O oh bird, then I, though a boy, for a golden moment share your feathery life in the air. Say, heart, is there anything at all like this in a world that is full of bliss? Tis more than skating, bound steel shod, shod to the level ground. Speed slackens now, I float a while in my airy boat till when the wheels scarce crawl, my feet to the treadles fall. Alas, the longest hill must end in a veil, but still, who climbs with toil, whosoever shall find wings waiting there. 
My love of the outdoors has evolved over time. It led me to working for the state parks in college, gaining a degree in horticulture, working in the landscape and design maintenance industry, and a love of gardening, hiking, kayaking, swimming, and biking, my favorite types of play as an adult. In conclusion, there's nothing that makes me feel more playful, alive, and free than riding my bike. Thank you.
Hello, my name is Annie Wegner Lafort. I'm a member of First Church, and I'm delighted to share my, my thoughts with you today on the topic of knowing how to play. No one over 40 should be getting on a slip and slide, declared my older sister at the end of the evening as we celebrated my parents' 50th wedding anniversary last summer. My partner, who always brings a childlike spirit, had packed his kids slip and slide with hopes that over the weekend we might set it up in the yard for some all ages water play. Admittedly, an hour before the party shut down wasn't ideal, as the last guests standing after hours of dancing, imbibing, and playing giant Jenga on my parents' patio were in no shape to take a running slide on a piece of plastic down a hill in the dark. But as the youngest child and sometimes still antagonistic little sister, I pushed back on her assertion, allowing my 40 plus but feeling like early 30s self a creative retort. Well, what if your biological age is under 40? She grimaced. My brother and I can easily turn on our playful spirits, set our work aside and let our hair down. Our sister on the other hand has been known to be the buzzkill in recent years an all-work and very little play kind of gal who runs a tight ship and still prides herself as the mother figure of us siblings. She couldn't be convinced in that moment, and in hindsight, I should probably thank her for being clear-headed. But still, why shouldn't we middle-aged folks be allowed to play, as I suggested? We don't stop playing because we grow old. We grow old because we stop playing, said George Bernard Shaw. How do you relate to this idea? Can you think of someone, perhaps yourself, who has embodied an image of playfulness throughout their life? If play has not been a part of your life, why not? Does play feel like a waste of time? Do you feel limited mentally or physically? There are certainly barriers to play. There is self-judgment that we're not good at something, so why bother? There is capitalism the looming idea that everything we do in our lives must be in the name of productivity. And there is the perceived judgment from others that will simply look foolish. There is also the pervasive heaviness we feel each time we see or hear the world news. How dare we be out flitting, scampering, skipping, and enjoying ourselves when wars are raging, the climate is changing, inflation is skyrocketing, and mental health challenges are epidemic. Perhaps all of those are the very reasons that we should play. I don't like to should on myself or others, but this is one realm in which I will make strong suggestions to get out there and do it. Play can bring physical and emotional pleasure. It can offer space for mental release and expansion. It can keep us physically fit and socially connected. Imagine a world where more people played, We've seen an uptick in dancing flash mobs and getting our elders involved in TikTok music videos. Imagine if play caught on even more and allowed people to de-stress, reconnect, and cultivate love. Perhaps play is a small part of the solution to diffuse and heal the world's turmoil. Perhaps it's exactly what our spirits need to build imagination, savor the present, and avoid despair. My parents are the ones I credit with my work hard, play hard ethic. They've modeled it in my entire life, for my entire life, as I recall their cookouts in our huge backyard in Racine, where it wasn't unusual for a full-scale softball game to follow dinner, or at least a pickup game of lawn jarts or a horseshoe tournament. They biked, my dad played racquetball, my mom was involved in community theater, and she took piano lessons. Their life of traveling with dear friends always includes shenanigans, sometimes eyebrow-raising shenanigans. They love to go out dancing, and they still regularly host themed dominoes parties at which they require everyone to wear a costume just because. King and queen are crowned at the end of the night. It's beautiful to hear my dad at 73 say how play makes him smile and laugh. My mom feels it keeps them positive, young, and laughing a lot. Their anniversary party alone was a play. We expected nothing less as they recruited my willing partner and my thespian brother to perform Someone to Love as Jake and Elwood Blues 
and their best friend to play the notorious SNL character, Father Guido Sarducci, to conduct the renewal of their vows. In case you're wondering, no, my parents honestly never embarrassed me in my adolescent and teen years. In fact, they inspired me to seek my own playful life and not take matters too gravely. Rule number six, according to my yoga teacher who threaded this idea through our training for four months, says, don't take life too seriously. She distilled this idea from beloved spiritual leader, the late Dr. Wayne Dyer, whose infinite wisdom on attachment, imperfection, and the law of attraction reminds us to laugh at ourselves. He says, yes, there are things you need to take seriously, your job, your family, your health, among others, but yourself, definitely not. He reminds us that we are not the center of the universe. We are not perfect. Every one of us, no matter how sexy or successful, has flaws, he quips. Play helps ground us in this reality. It gives us a space to be imperfect, less than glamorous, and to remember that there's something bigger in this world. Dyer believes that if we want to live a truly happy life, we should not try to cover up these flaws, but instead embrace them, make light of them, and laugh at them. A great way to embrace that light and laughter is through play. You may have seen the meme, don't be afraid to suck at something new. At best, you may find a new activity, interest, or people you really dig. At worst, you may create an opportunity to laugh while making a beautiful fool of yourself doing something different. That's been my story with acro yoga, Latin dance, and capoeira all activities I began in the physical rehabilitation part of my rebirth six years ago after lifestyle and occupational stress landed me in the emergency room. After years of putting myself last and never really considering the importance of play, the stress of life culminated in a neck injury, including the most horribly shocking body sensations of my life. I'd take 10 more unmedicated home births over nerve pain any day. Given my upbringing in a playful family, you might wonder how I reached that level of stress in my adult life, how I let play go by the wayside. I went through many years in my 20s and 30s without prioritizing play outside of the drinking and partying realm. I became a mother at 30. It's been the hardest job I've ever loved. And early on, it was extremely challenging for me mentally, emotionally, and physically. While I've always had incredible support from my co-parent, I didn't always give myself support. I felt pressure to be the right kind of mother and struggled to connect with my child in the ways that I thought parents were supposed to play. Building with blocks, playing in the yard, running in the park, dancing to kitty songs. I'd watch my co-parent enjoying all of those activities with our daughter and stand by wishing I could conjure that enjoyment. I felt guilty as a part-time stay-at-home mom, so I pushed farther into proving my worth by working to make a home and often running myself ragged in the process. I remember watching my co-parent and daughter playing tag or running in a field or on the beach while we camped. It looked like a blast, but all I could focus on was the work that seemed more important at the time to keep our travels organized and on schedule. I missed out on opportunities to enjoy my daughter's playfulness while she was little and to connect with my then husband in a unique way. I continue to feel divided in my desire to provide, but also engage authentically. I've managed to detach from most expectations and for several years now have connected with my daughter through reading, cooking, and exploring art. Since I've become more physically active, we also enjoy dancing together, tossing a frisbee, practi practicing splits and handstands, and playing in the water. My injury was a huge wake-up call on many fronts and gratefully opened my eyes to all I had foregone. I don't intend to miss out on play anymore. The play that I have engaged in most frequently over the last several years has been very active. I'm grateful to feel strong, flexible, and fit in order to maintain that. I understand people can feel physical limitations or more cautious these days as the risk of injury could break the bank. I learned that the hard way after a broken back from a martial arts injury in 2019. Ironically, it was the play that harmed me, but also my fitness level from a regular practice of play that helped me heal quickly. Know that play can start with small, subtle endeavors. People perceive me as one who rarely stops moving. 
That is a fair assessment, and I attribute that near constant motion to my kinesthetic learning process, my hardwiring, and my recovery from the years I spent surviving and not thriving. While movement is my joy, please understand that play doesn't have to include intense physical activity. The level and style of play is bio-individual, a term I've discovered in my current health coach training program. We all need different things for our bodies, and that requirement can change throughout our lives. Play can be setting aside time to color or create art or do a jigsaw puzzle, as my daughter and I love. Play can even be having fun with your hair or fashion style or experimenting in the, ki in the kitchen, playing with new ingredient combinations and flavors to create recipes. According to Dr. Stuart Brown, physician, psychiatrist, and founder of the National Institute for Play, a nonprofit organization dedicated to fostering and better integrating play research, play is something done for its own sake, he explains. It's voluntary. It's pleasurable. It offers a sense of engagement. It takes you out of time. And the act itself is more important than the outcome. If it feels like a stretch to incorporate play in your life just for the fun of it, perhaps you could be convinced if you know it's also good for your health. Research shows that play contributes to improved mood, reduced stress, better brain function, and increased longevity. Adult play is important for building community, keeping the mind sharp, and keeping close the ones you love. Brown notes that adults are designed to play their entire lives. In a 2018 TED Talk, he encouraged them to revisit their lighthearted moments and give in to their impulse to laugh, to roughhouse, dance, and make light of life as a matter of neurological survival. Play can trigger the release of endorphins, the body's natural feel-good chemicals, which promote an overall sense of well-being and can temporarily relieve pain. Play can also help prevent memory loss and boost creativity. In my experience with dance classes, I swear I can feel my brain building new pathways as I'm challenged to remember choreography or to grasp new steps or combos. As a member of DanceWorks Intergenerational Performance Company, along with other members of this congregation, I've been challenged with exercises in our weekly workshops, or rather play shops, to remember intricate movements on the spot. We're not tested on these steps, just simply challenged to move our bodies and see what they can recall in the moment. Some days I feel just as mentally stretched in that space as our most seasoned members. It's a space to be vulnerable, to improvise, to flow, and to create. I drop into this workshop immediately after my bi-weekly talk therapy sessions, which helps me integrate whatever has surfaced emotionally and literally moving through the process so that those feelings can heal emotional wounds. As DIPC allows space to be spontaneous, Panadansa Dance Company provides a ground for me to give myself grace. As a person who loves to analyze and overanalyze and meta-analyze, I've had to remind myself to get out of my head and into my body more frequently. That's helped me create a stronger mind-body connection, feel free in my skin, and smile a lot more as I make mistakes. One of the biggest gifts of adding play to my life has been the social aspect of it. Developing a playful nature can help us loosen up, break the ice with strangers, and make new friends. I meet with Samba De Vida, my drum family, my drum group, weekly to rehearse, jam, and laugh a lot. They've been a rock for me through some very tumultuous recent years. There's an incredible sense of belonging in this group, and the ashe, or energy, we create in that weekly space offers a vitality boost, for sure. This intergenerational, multicultural group I call my drum family has been my most consistent activity through the pandemic. We convened on Zoom for a few months before taking our practice outdoors in the summer of 2020. We've met nearly every week and continue to build a family vibe in our rhythm community. We have the purpose of practicing to perform, but we also make space to bring drums and openly jam anytime someone has a birthday or backyard barbecue. We're not really capable of gathering without our drums. 
My capoeira and acro yoga groups have also been known to round people up for regular play sessions in the park on weekends. We flip, fly, and flow, often drawing curious crowds and recruiting new members. It feels good to be part of a group that's so inclusive and welcoming. That openness is precisely what led me to meeting my partner. Relationships are also strongly built and sustained through play. We met through acro yoga, acrobatic yoga, and have maintained a foundation of play and playfulness on our journey as we enjoy mountain biking, swimming, hiking, especially in the mud, and dancing. In relationships, play brings joy and resilience and can most definitely help heal conflict and heal past wounds. We often refer to rule number six. As we connected through acro yoga, a physical practice that requires trust, incorporates nonverbal communication, and demands frequent recalibration, we've opened ourselves to intimacy on many levels, stayed present, and maintained a willingness to try new things. Plato said, you can discover more about a person in an hour of play than in a year of conversation. Our relationship is full of play, which has helped us get to know each other at an accelerated rate and on a deeper level. In their book, Getting the Love You Want, life partners and creators of Imago Relationship Therapy, Harville Hendricks and Helen LaCalle Hunt, encourage couples to try a re-romanticizing process. They ask their clients to engage in several playful, high-energy, fun activities per week. Spontaneous one-on-one -on -one activities like wrestling, tickling, massaging, jumping up and down, or dancing. They recognize that when couples have more fun together, they identify each other as a source of pleasure and safety, which intensifies their emotional bond. When the old brain registers a positive flow of energy, Hendricks says, it knows that the person associated with the energy is connected to life and safety, and the two people begin to connect with each other on a deeper, unconscious level. And that can help us feel more connected and alive. Many of us were subconsciously taught as kids that being fully alive was dangerous as we jumped on the bed or out of trees. But I see now, after years of suppressing my playful spirit, that it might be more detrimental not to incorporate play into our lives in some way. Brown says that if we don't play, there are serious consequences. What you begin to see when there's major play deprivation in an otherwise competent adult is that they're not much fun to be around, he says. You begin to see that the perseverance and joy in work is lessened and that life is much more laborious. In other words, all work and no play makes everyone a whole lot duller. In a recent call with my sister, I asked, what's bringing you joy? She made it known that she doesn't have time for joy in her life. That brings me concern, though I know it's not mine to advise. I will choose to live by example for my big sis and others, as I recall a former life that was much more serious and much less fulfilling. In her book, Permission to Come Home, Jenny T. Wang asks, Whatever your life circumstances, can you find the time to allow yourself to consider how you might introduce play as a healing practice for exhaustion and as a form of medicine for our epidemic of overfunctioning, loneliness, and burnout? Perhaps for you, this medicine may come in the form of planning dinner and a movie at home with your kids, where you put away your phones and just savor the evening, or taking an hour out of your day to go for a leisurely walk with a friend and notice every smell in the air. She reminds us that play does not have to be a lavish trip to an exotic location. It can be found in the ordinary moments if you're willing to create magic within every day. Play feeds our souls and makes the work of life and relationship more bearable. I have felt this 100%. If you've put play on the back burner, feeling that work or other commitments are priorities, I encourage you to find ways, whether it's play with your partner, your friends, coworkers, pets, children, grandchildren, to rekindle your spirit, find release, and let your hair down just because. <laughs> I look forward to keeping play in my life as long as possible. I am inspired and encouraged by those lively souls born way before me. I love going to outdoor concerts in the summer and seeing my elders dancing, no matter how slowly or stiffly moving their bodies to the beat. I love seeing the senior social groups that gather to play through the local recreation department. I love seeing the wise souls in our community getting together to craft. 
I think of my step-grandmother who lived to 96 playing bingo multiple times per week. Let's give ourselves permission to play as a form of self-care, crucial for the health and longevity of our minds, bodies, and spirits. If you're already choosing play in your life, I thank you for that investment in yourself and our world. If you'd like to begin adding more play, consider what's possible in your current life. How can you take baby steps? Where can you begin to add lightness and joy to your days? I encourage you to start small. Meet yourself where you are with bio-individuality, your unique needs in mind. Start somewhere, but start. Thank you. Dear ones, I'll leave you with these closing words by Arthur Foote. May peace dwell within our hearts and understanding in our minds. May courage steal our wills and love of truth forever guide us. May it be so. We are going Heaven knows where we are going, we know within, and we will get there. Heaven knows how we will get there, but we know.